Hi, I'm Will from Testin. I'm Norm from Testin. Norm, CES may be over, but we did see a ton of technology that you can actually buy. Maybe not right now, but very, very soon. Real products, not yeah. just future looking you know, stuff. Yeah, so here's a list of some of the best products that we saw from CES that we would actually want to buy ourselves. Uh, first on my list is Toshiba's 4K TV, the Regza 55 X3. It is a 4K resolution TV, which means that it's essentially four 1080p resolutions crammed into one 55 inch shell. A lot of TV. Uh, and in addition to having 4K and you know, upscaler for 1080p content and all that stuff, it had a lenticular uh, overlay that lets it do glasses free 3D for up to nine people. And this TV actually is on sale right now in Japan. Yes. And on sale in Europe. Toshiba hopefully will bring it to the US this year. Hopefully it's a here. real product, 55 inch 4K resolution with a good upscaler. Really exciting. It's a little bit expensive though, uh, depending on what the exchange rate is based on the Japanese price. It looks like it's going to come in around 10,000 US dollars. So I wouldn't recommend saving your money and buying this this year, but it's a really good glimpse at what we'll be able to get next year and the year after. Uh, another exciting product that's also coming out later this year is Lenovo's Yoga, IdeaPad Yoga laptop. And I think this is the, probably the most innovative laptop I saw at CES because it's a Windows 8 laptop that folds all the way back and it's both a tablet and a laptop. Now, I feel like we've done this whole thing before because uh, Windows XP Tablet Edition launched in 2002, I believe, mm -hmm. and we saw a whole mess of these the convertible tablets that weren't very good. What, what's changed with, with the Yoga and the new wave of convertible tablet PCs? Yeah, so instead of being a swivel screen, it flips all the way back and the, it's smart enough that the keyboard and trackpad turn off when it's in its tablet mode. Windows 8 is obviously optimized for touchscreen. Mm -hmm. It's a 10 point touchscreen, which is much higher sensitivity than you get on traditional uh, traditional convertible. And also, it's really light and, and it's, thin. It's a capacitive touchscreen as well, so you have 10, 10, point, 10 finger yes. touch. Uh, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. The industrial design was really nice on that. It kind of bridges the traditional ThinkPad design and the more consumer friendly IdeaPad design. I, I thought it's an exciting one. And speaking laptop. of bridges, it's going to run Ivy Bridge and yeah. launch at $1,200, which I think is a very attractive price. For what should be a very capable laptop. Yes. Uh, next up on my list is MakerBot's Replicator. Obviously, we like MakerBot here. We've had a cupcake, we've had a thingamatic. Replicator is the first consumer friendly version of the MakerBot. We, we had to assemble the cupcake and the thingamatic ourselves, uh, you know, over a 10 or 12 hour period where we moved very, very quickly uh, and there was some funny music playing in the background. This one's gonna come shipped in a box, ready to use. All you need to do is open it up, plug it in, maybe set a few calibrations and guidelines and stuff like that. Yeah. But it's supposed to be much, much less kind of hacker, uh, required much less of a hacker aesthetic than uh, say the existing MakerBots. And they're calling it the replicator, but it'll also build things as big as a loaf of bread. I'm glad they didn't call it the loaf of bread. No, the loaf of bread would be a terrible, terrible name. Uh, other big things that have changed are the option of adding a second print head. Uh, initially, that'll just be for multiple colors of plastic. But uh, the hope is that one day you'll be able to use two different materials, one that's perhaps water soluble and one that isn't, so that you can use the water soluble plastic to help support the structure as it builds and cools, and then dissolve that away and have a nice big hollow sphere or something awesome like that. Uh, I can't wait to get our hands on the replicator. Uh, we have one, can we see? Mm. Uh, so we also saw a ton of cell phones at CES, and one of the cell phones that we're most excited for is Nokia's Lumia 900. Finally, it's a flagship Windows Phone 7 smartphone available for the US. Two things make this really exciting. One is that it's gonna be LTE, so yeah. real 4G LTE on AT&T, and second, also the camera finally on this phone is as good as Nokia's other phones. So Carl Zeiss lens, wide angle, really good aperture, and the photos I took with it look really nice. Um, if you're a fan of Windows Phone 7, this is the one for you. They've also added a front-facing camera, finally, so you can do uh, Skype calls voice to voice. Yeah. Uh, and if you handled the Lumia 800 at all or saw our coverage of it, you know that the polycarbonate shell is a really nice, it fits in your hand really wonderfully. Uh, it, it's a good OLED screen. I'm really excited about this phone. It's going to be available real soon. It's a beautiful design, 4.3-inch screen, bigger probably because they need more battery for the LTE, uh, but it still feels really good in your yeah. hand. I also got to put on a pair of uh, very fancy high-end audiophile headphones, the Sennheiser HD 800s. They're brand new introduced to the show, and there's all sorts of audiophile crap in there. I'm not going to talk about that at all because I think I don't really understand it. And, and all I know is that I put those on and I felt like I was sitting in the perfect seat in an acoustically perfect stadium listening to Pink Floyd play Dark Side of the Moon. And it was really, really amazing. 
Uh, now, there's a lot of gotchas with high-end headphones, of course. These have much higher impedance than a normal, uh, like a pair of earbuds or even a normal pair of high-end headphones. So you do have to use a pretty good headphone amp. We were listening to a Super Audio CD source, which is a higher bit rate, higher fidelity than traditional audio, you know, CD audio, and uh, obviously much better than compressed audio like MP3 and stuff like that. But yeah, you got to try them out too, Norm. What, what did you think? Uh, they sounded amazing. I mean, the look on your face when you put them on tells oh, yeah. it all. Uh, and not headphones that you want to take on the street. They're definitely headphones for listening at home to complement a really nice home audio yeah. system. Sit, sit in a comfy chair, light a fire, get your book, lean back and, and envelop yourself in sound. Uh, one of the things that was interesting, I was talking to those guys, you know, these are very expensive headphones. $1,500 headphones, plus an amp, plus the SACD and all the media to support that. Uh, these are for people who are really interested in getting a perfect audio listening experience uh, and who maybe don't have a room or want to convert a room to, to support that. So you know, if, you're, if you're not interested in tearing out walls and insulating rooms, putting in $5,000, $6,000 worth of speakers, this is a good way to get comparable sound without having to spend too much money. Too much money. So in earlier in 2011, Fujifilm released one of their first mirrorless cameras, the X100. We reviewed it, really liked it, but it only had a fixed lens. At CES, they announced the X-Pro1, which is another the second mirrorless camera, this time with interchangeable lenses, and it looks amazing. It's a mirrorless camera with APS-C size sensor that takes photos, about, they're comparing it to like a Canon 5D Mark II. Ooh. And so it, it, the image qualities really were great. You had optical viewfinder and a digital viewfinder on the camera itself, so hmm. perfect uh, adjustment. And a lot of knobs and, and yes. bells and whistles and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, it looked a lot like a rangefinder, like a Leica. Uh, obviously, it's a high-end, high-end mirrorless camera. And while I didn't get a chance to sit in it, Mr. Chan did that, I could not be more excited about the Tesla S. This is a Tesla second generation car. It's a it's a four door coupe instead of a roadster. So it's a much more practical car and has a range up to like three, 400 miles depending on which battery options you choose. But the thing that was most interesting about the Tesla for us as computer nerds was the fact that the two the, the car's two flat panel displays, one behind the wheel with the speedometer and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And the, the whole center console where you control air conditioning and radio and nav and all that were both powered by NVIDIA's Tiger 2 chips running Linux. Yeah. Uh, Norm, you got to spend some hands on time with it and you browse the web from inside the car. Oh my God, I, I can't believe that they're allowing people to do this, but there's a 17 inch capacitive touchscreen in there, in the car as your dash. And not only do you get your uh, your navigation, and your maps, and your phone numbers and stuff like that, but you also get a full WebKit based browser in the car on a 17 inch display. That is ridiculous. And I, I want this car more than anything else. So how is having a like a real display in the center of the car, it's an electric car that's got to impact battery life some, right, Norm? Yeah, they're they're saying it won't impact as much battery life. Obviously, the car has a big battery, especially okay. if you get the full 300 mile one. Uh, one I'm more more worried about is lack of haptic feedback uh, for the response times. But hope, yeah, I, I guess you got to just know where you're touching on the screen. The car also has LTE 4G built in when that becomes available with hotspots in your mirrors, so you can actually uh, browse the web. So you could be browsing the web on your iPad and on the center console, yes. all while driving your car down the freeway. Nothing sounds safer than that. I want that car. And finally, uh, this is a product that was released last year, but it's getting an upgrade this year. It's the GoPro HD2 Hero. It's a portable camera that's rugged that you can basically mount on anything, right? So you could put it on a surfboard, you could put it on your dog, you could put it on your helmet when you're going skydiving. Not only can you do that, but now there's something called a Wi-Fi backpack they've released that enhances it so you can remotely activate the camera and also uh, view what you're seeing on a smartphone. Siri activate GoPro. Yeah, well, you don't, not voice control. It's a oh, button control. No voice on, control. On a wristband, but on a, for example, if you're skiing down a hill, someone could see what you're, what you're seeing on the camera with their phone using an app oh. and also activate the camera from there. Perfect if you're buried in an avalanche. Norm, I know you are super into extreme sports. What are you going to be using this for when you get a GoPro? Uh, riding more bowls, mechanical bowls. Okay, and recording that's board extreme, games. That's extreme. Board games. Ego. And board games. Okay, seems right. Yes. Uh, so these are our favorite uh, products, the things you can actually buy, if not right now, then real soon at CES 2012. Until next time, I'm Will. I'm Norm. Bye.